So, listen to this. In the debate for who gets the title of the most elegant footballer in history, Dennis Bergkamp stands above all else, with every other candidate worshipping him like some sort of messiah. Johan Cruyff once claimed that in every dictionary next to the word footballer, there should be a picture of him. Van Basten claimed that if any player in the world was worth 20 million, then Bergkamp was worth 100. And Henri, a man who shared the pitch with Ronaldinho, Messi and Zidane, claimed he was the best footballer he ever got to play. Play with. And yet, the best description of what it felt like to watch Bergkamp came from John Hartson, who said that if Bergkamp played in the snow, he would leave no footprints behind. It was what you call a Rolls Royce footballer. If Bergkamp ever ran, I certainly could not tell. Every time it looked like he floated across the pitch, everything came so effortlessly to him that with just two or three touches he could do what others would need 20 to do. And it seemed there wasn't one time where he just scored a normal goal. Every single one of them was a piece of art. As one newspaper once wrote, it was like an angel sent back to earth to spread the football gospel. So, no wonder it was such a prodigy. With a gymnast for a mom and an amateur footballer for a dad, by the age of nine, Bergkamp had joined an athletics club and dominated everything, from sprinting to marathons, long jump, even shot put. But thanks to his dad naming him in honor of the great tennis law and to the fact that nothing ever mesmerized him quite as much as the moment he killed a ball dead on his foot, soon he had realized his true calling was football. By 11, he had joined Ajax, and by 12, Johan Cruyff himself had found him and gotten so hypnotized by his first touch that he took him under his wing as his protege and began building the player he would eventually declare as the heir to his throne. From the moment Cruyff took over as the new Ajax manager, his only goal was to create a legacy of ultra-attacking football. The guy didn't listen to a word anyone had to say, he got there and before you knew it, he'd be hard-pressed to find a player on his team above the age of 23. They were so ruthless in transition, the papers began referring to them as Cruyff's suicide bombers. And yet, he wasn't satisfied. He kept telling the press that if you're good enough, you're old enough, and his obsession with Verkamp made that very clear. It's hard to put into words how hard Cruyff was on the kid, while only 15 years old, still back in the academy, he had him demoted so that he'd be man-marked by multiple players while having to carry the team on his back. Then, he forced him to play everywhere until he had mastered every position on the pitch, and after months of torture, he gave him his debut, and what followed was one of the most terrifying starts to a career in the history of football. After only three matches for the club, Cruyff went up to the kid and told them he'd be calling him up for their away match against Malmo in the Cup Winners' Cup quarterfinals. At first, Bergkamp was over the moon, but once the match was delayed due to a snowstorm, he checked his calendar and noticed he wouldn't be able to join the team, as he had a biology exam the day before the match. Cruyff, however, refused to back down and had one of the club's representatives waiting for Bergkamp outside his school, where he first put him on a plane to Copenhagen and then proceeded to cross the north see by boat so that he could be there. Once the reporters heard of this story, they ridiculed both the player and the coach, asking what 17-year-old could ever be worth such trouble? Well, to their satisfaction, that day, Ajax lost 1-0, but Bergkamp had only played 14 minutes, so going against everyone's advice in the second leg, Cruyff put him on the starting 11. That day, Bergkamp looked nothing like the player he'd go on to become. Cast out to the wing, seeming nervous and twitchy, but you'll be hard-pressed to find another young player capable of tormenting his marker the way he did. As Reichardt said, Dennis toyed with that man, he left him colorblind. And so, by the 87th minute, even with Van Basten dominating the score sheet, once Cruyff took Bergkamp off the pitch, all of the 25,000 fans watching rose from their seats and applauded. He had been a regular starter for less than a month. Once Cruyff got to the post-match conference, they asked him why he was keeping a player like that in the reserves and he replied, you got it wrong, it's not Bergkamp who's training with the reserves, we've been using the reserves to train Bergkamp. And if you're wondering about his biology exam, he passed, but after that day, Bergkamp never went back to school. By the end of the year, he'd be on the pitch leaving the dream as Ajax won the Cup Winners' Cup. However, well, eight months later, Cruyff was gone and what proceeded were six different managers in three years. 
Look, that very same season, when Ajax wasted the chance to take a second Cup Winners Cup in a row, every fan could tell things were bad. But then, then Kurt Linder arrived. To put it short, it was the anti cruyff The moment he met him, he sent Bergkamp back down to the academy and told their new coach that this guy is useless. Thankfully, that coach was Louis van Gaal, who was not just smart enough to see that he was wrong, but to take Bergkamp, put him in the number 10 position, realize that it wasn't quite his natural role, then deploying him instead as what he called a shadow striker and watching as he began dominating every match. But the thing is, that shadow striker was just a false nine only decades before it became a thing. Which became quite useful when five matches into the league season, Kurt Linder was sacked, with Van Gaal being brought up to assistant coach, bringing Bergkamp with him and deploying him in that same role, as he instantly went on a streak of 13 goals in 13 matches, completely flipping their form around, only for Leo Ben Acker to be brought in as manager only a few months later, not just dropping Bergkamp to the bench repeatedly, but refusing to call him up to the 1990 World Cup as he also happened to be the national team manager, which must have stirred something deep inside Bergkamp's guts, because when he came back from his summer vacation, not even Ben Acker could deny it, in his own words, I was confronted with a completely transformed man. Now Dennis was confident, defiant, as if he was looking at me and saying, come on then, I'll show you what I'm made of. Bergkamp opened that season with 6 goals in 6 matches, then he was called up for the Euros qualifiers and scored just 7 minutes into their match against Greece, came back, scored against title holders PSV, went on a run of 10 goals in 9 matches and before you knew it, the season was over and not only had he scored twice as many goals as anyone else in the team, but he had etched his name at the top of the goal scoring charts, tying the legendary Romario after years of reporters deeming him as unbeatable. And that... That was before Ben Hacker left, allowing Van Gaal to take over the team. When Bergkamp started his year by scoring 10 in his first 7 matches, including that ridiculous chip against RKC Valvik, it seemed almost like a warning, but believe it or not, that would not be the year he finally led Ajax to the league title. Instead, it quickly became clear he had his eyes set on the UEFA Cup. In the first round, he opened the scoring with a nearly 40-yard free kick, then dribbled the keeper to clutch their win in the second round's first leg, not to mention that he also assisted the opener in the home match, then scoring both of their goals home and away in the last 16, adding one more, as well as another assist in the quarters and still somehow saving his best performance for the semi-finals, where he put in the cross for their second goal, then clutched the first leg with a last-minute assist before scoring their second leg's only goal as the Noah got within inches of turning the match around. And as for the final, well, it was Bergkamp who won the penalty that gave them their second away goal, meaning that even once he missed out on the second leg after coming down with a fever, it was that penalty that decided everything through the away goals rule. So, when Van Gaal grabbed the microphone during the celebrations and asked the crowd that they should thank for their victory, only one name was heard. Danish Bergkamp, which meant one thing. This time, he had a guaranteed place at the Euros, but though he'd make it to the team of the tournament, scoring in every single match, except for their goalless draw against the Soviet Union, not only did he watch as his team tragically succumbed on penalties one step away from the final, but when they asked him how it felt to be the Euros top scorer in his first ever tournament, as ice cold as ever, he replied, I'm just doing my job. But by the end of that year, he was third in the Ballon d'Or. At this point, everyone in Europe was after him, but with Real Madrid and AC Milan leading the race, Cruyff trying to convince him that every move other than joining him was a terrible decision and Van Gaal begging him not to let his transfer saga distract him from their title race. Only 36 hours before their big match against PSV, Bergkamp agreed to a move to Inter, still somehow going into that match, grabbing hold of a 50-yard pass and chipping the keeper to score Ajax's only goal as they went on to lose and drop to second place regardless. Announcing his move the next morning, becoming the most expensive Dutch player in history, and starting an hilarious feud with Van Gaal, who from there on out insisted on subbing him off even as he kept on scoring some of the most beautiful goals you'll ever see, not just carrying Ajax to the cup title, scoring the quarter semis and the final, but eventually being named as the player of the year for the second time in a row. Though, one thing is sure, he should have listened to Cruyff. When Bergkamp arrived in Milan, he was so confident that when he got a tour of his new house and saw that the landlord was yet to move his Ferrari out of the garage, he bet that if he scored 20 league goals, he'd get to keep it. 
But a year later, he hadn't even managed to reach double digits and with Inter finishing the league season only one point above the relegation line, with Bergkamp accusing the board of breaking their promise that they play more attacking-minded football, as well as the fact that he hated his striking partner Ruben Sosa, implying that he was purposely sabotaging him out of jealousy. Well, hadn't Bergkamp once again demolished everyone in the UEFA Cup, who knows what would have happened. But instead, he opened the first round with a hat-trick, then two more goals in the second round, another two in the last 16, and insisting the dying minutes against Dortmund to seal their place in the semis, where after losing the first leg 3-2, he again pulled off his best performance, assisting two and scoring another to demolish them 3-0, and making sure that even after failing to get on the score sheet in the final, as Inter lifted the cup, it was Bergkamp's name at the top of the goal-scoring shards. But if that was more than enough to buy him some time as the fans slowly forgot his nightmarish domestic season, the following year would be 10 times worse. At the World Cup, with Gullit controversially refusing to play and Van Basten going out injured, Bergkamp was tasked with carrying a team that just two matches in was already risking a group stage elimination. But even though from that moment on he proceeded to score in every remaining match, not only would he still be knocked out in the quarters, but in the middle of all of this, one of their flights would first be delayed due to a false bomb threat, with the engine of the plane then coincidentally cutting off mid-flight, which, paired with the fact that just a few years earlier a plane carrying 18 air divisi players, including one of Bergkamp's old teammates crashed in Surinam, killing them near everyone on board, meant that from that day on, Bergkamp became completely terrified of flying, insisting on driving alone to away matches, creating even more of a divide between him and his teammates and giving the media even more reason to question his character, which added to the club not just refusing to give him time to rest after the World Cup, but failing to get him any proper physical therapy, meant that he ended up not just mentally broken, but also physically, setting him up for such a horrible season that the Italian media began constantly mocking him, saying he was losing his air because of the stress, eventually even renaming their Donkey of the Week award to the Bergkamp of the Week as he finished the season with only two league goals. It cannot be overstated how much everyone thought that he would kill his own career once, despite his no-flying role limiting the number of clubs willing to give him a shot, he rejected the chance to move to Bayern or to finally unite forces with Cruyff, to instead join an Arsenal side that had just finished a mere six points above the relegation line, all based on what he described as a gut feeling. As Arsenal was making Bergkamp their all-time record signing, three times more expensive than any other, they had the president of Inter himself telling them that they'd be lucky if Bergkamp scored 10 goals for them, while even in his own country, he had journalists straight up writing that he is not a winner, he's a loser, he's a sissy. It couldn't get any lower than that. And maybe that's why it didn't. Against everyone's expectations, Bergkamp ended up becoming the first brick in the wall of one of the greatest dynasties in the history of football. The day he arrived at his first training session, Ian Wright went up to him and asked him one favor. Please get us back into Europe, to which Bergkamp told him he'd do all he could. And so, after seven goalless matches, as the away crowd chanted that it was a waste of money, Bergkamp opened his tally with a volley, then smacked in a screamer from outside the box, and as his teammates rushed towards them, you could see it in their faces why, by the end of the season, Ian Wright had gotten accustomed to referring to Bergkamp as the Messiah. Arsenal were already back in the UEFA Cup, and that was before the great man arrived. After a troublesome Euros, Arsene Wenger joined Bergkamp at Highbury and things changed. Just listen. When Arsenal found themselves drawn at a goal each with two minutes to go in Wenger's first North London derby, out of nowhere, Bergkamp flicked the ball over Sol Campbell's hat so that Tony Adams could put them in front. And before Tottenham could even think of getting back at them, Bergkamp effortlessly controlled the 30-yard cross with a single touch and sent the ball into the net. Looking back now, I think that was the day he announced that the good old boring Arsenal were here to take over and to do it in style. By September of the next year, Bergkamp was on 17 goal contributions in 9 matches and midway through it, he had scored his first English hat-trick. The first goal was a long-range curler, the second was a deadly run that required just 2 touches and though for his final one, he did take one more touch, it was the goal of the season. Which is impressive until he realized that when added to that first one and to his goal in the previous match, by the end of the month, Bergkamp had become the only player in history to have scored all 3 strikes that made up the podium 
for the Premier League's Goal of the Month. Not to mention that by December, Bergkamp was again in third place at the FIFA World Player of the Year. By February, table leaders Man United began to lose steam and by April, Arsenal had come down from his lowest sixth in the table to taking the league and cup double, as Bergkamp was named as the new King of England, the PFA Player of the Year, and yet, that felt like nothing compared to what happened next. At the 1998 World Cup against Argentina, Bergkamp gave us what is quite simply one of the greatest displays of perfect technique in the history of the sport. As defender Roberto Ayala said, I've watched it over and over again, I didn't make a mistake, it was just impossible to get to him. However, even if that goal meant that Bergkamp was on 6 goal contributions in 4 matches, by the end, he was yet again being knocked out in the semis on penalties. But still, I don't feel bad for him. A year later, after watching the title slip in between his fingers in the second to last match day of the season, Wenger, watching as Bergkamp closed in on his 31st birthday, decided to retrace his steps, breaking their transfer record for a young player that had failed miserably in Italy. That player was Thierry Henry, and had Bergkamp into that final and won that tournament, Henry would have never joined Juventus, he would have never been brought in to replace him, and trust me, that unlikely partnership was worth everything they had to go through. Listen, I'm not gonna lie, their first years together were rough. After scoring 10 goals between them to get to the UEFA Cup final, they lost on penalties. Then, after another great performance in the Euros, Bergkamp watched as his teammates missed two penalties during the semi-final and then three more in the shootout as he decided to quite simply retire from national team football. And by 2001, they had finished second behind United for the third year in a row. But as the fans began daydreaming of what it could have been like if a young Bergkamp was still available to join Henri, at 33 years of age, he experienced a revival. 53 goal contributions between the two, with the veteran somehow giving the young kid on the block a run for his money as they brought the League and Cup double back to North London, somehow, at times, even managing to steal the spotlight, scoring a goal so unbelievable against Newcastle that when they asked his defender if he felt embarrassed that it had become the most replayed moment of his career, he replied, Not at all. I'm proud of it. I will forever remain an actor in a work of art performed by a genius. And still, two years later, with their camp already so old they had him on a season-by-season -season contract, they orchestrated their greatest ever stunt, winning the Premier League without losing a single match. Matter of fact, a year later, Bergkamp was determined to end his career, but with 20 goal contributions in 1900 minutes and a hat-trick of assists in the second to last match of the season, the fans kept chanting one more year, and so, he obliged. And 75 minutes into the final match of his career, as Arsenal led 1-0 in a Champions League final and Arsene Wenger looked back at his most loyal soldier sitting on the bench, preparing to give him a fairy tale ending. Instead, Eto scored, Belletti scored, the night ended in tears, and as Bergkamp said goodbye to football, the Highbury Stadium was demolished, almost as if it died with him.